Today on Inspired Money. Or I'm, you know, making a film or even building a business. I'm telling a story through all those channels. And that's why, you know, even though entrepreneurship and being a business owner is a really big part of my identity today, I still identify more strongly as an artist. This is episode 88 with award-winning filmmaker, director, writer, and entrepreneur, Sarah Nguyen. Welcome to Inspired Money. My name is Andy Wong, a managing partner at Runnymede Capital Management. Each week, we bring you an interesting person to help you get inspired, shift your perspectives on money, and achieve incredible things. From making it to giving it away, Inspired money means making a difference, creating something bigger than oneself, and maybe, just maybe, making the world a better place. Thank you for joining me. Hey, Inspired Money Maker, welcome back. If it's your first time tuning in, welcome. Inspired Money is different from other personal finance podcasts because we don't want to just learn how to live with money. We want to help each other to live richer lives, make a greater impact, and together, make the world a better place. Today, we've got Sarah Nguyen on the show. She's a first-generation Vietnamese-American. She's been called a renaissance woman of the millennial generation, and here's why. Sarah has toured universities and venues across the country, performing spoken word poetry and facilitating workshops. She's a visual artist painting under the alias Vera Times, and she's collaborated with brands like Coach. Sarah helped launch the video channel for NBC Asian America through creating and producing the first documentary series to premiere on the channel. She has her own production company called One Ounce Gold. She's an entrepreneur having opened a restaurant and a coffee business. She's a 2018 Google Next Gen tech policy leader, meaning that she works with leaders across the country to explore creative solutions for tech policy and racial justice. Phew, that is a lot. I'm a little winded after that introduction. In this episode, you'll learn the importance of finding your voice, the power of storytelling, whether applied to painting, film, or business. For today's guest, it's all three. And how Sarah, as a creative, can bridge her art and business. One more thing before we get started. This interview was recorded in person at Sarah's Listening Party podcasting studio located inside Canal Street Market in Manhattan's Chinatown. So a special thanks to Sarah because it's always a treat to sit down face-to-face in person with somebody and for lending her equipment for the recording today. Now let's get inspired with Sarah Nguyen. So Sarah, welcome to Inspired Money. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me, Andy. Let's jump right in. What's your earliest childhood memory of money? I would say that there wasn't really a moment that marks this earliest memory, but I will say that I feel like growing up throughout my entire childhood, I remember my relationship with money being really frugal, right? So if I was going, um, you know, grocery shopping with my mom, it was always about price checking and like always kind of choosing like um, the non-name brand snacks. Like I couldn't get Nabisco or like any of the really fancy brands. It would be more like the generic like store brand because it was a little bit cheaper. And I remember just like with shopping with my mom, like we were always very money conscious about the items we chose on the shelves. It, Everything from Ziploc bags or just like the flap and fold bags, right? We always got like the cheaper item. I just remember things like Oreos or like marshmallow wheels was like such a prized item that I would maybe get like once a quarter, like when my mom felt like giving it to me. But for the most part, we were very frugal. And I remember that being like a, a strong indicator of my memory of money. It's kind of a common immigrant experience, I think. Mm -hmm. Has that changed drastically over time or is there still a part of you that follows that? Mm, Well, I definitely think that my mom has, and both my parents really have instilled in me an awareness around money where, you know, we want to be frugal, we want to be mindful, um, we don't want to be wasteful, you know, but definitely for myself as I've grown up and become an adult, um, I mean, yeah, I like to splurge sometimes. You know? I like to ball out or I want to treat myself because, you know, now that I'm making my own money, I, I never got the opportunity to do that. So I do once in a while enjoy 
and, and once in like a long while, like I'll enjoy like splurging or balling out. Um, but for the most part, you know, I'm not frivolous with my money and I don't just throw it around. I really value every every cent that I have. And so I try to be very mindful about spending it, whether it's choosing a more like a cheaper you know, item or if it's spending a lot of money on something, but really valuing it and then like giving it it's really it's full wear or it's full lifetime by using it very often. Yeah, it sounds like you're being very thoughtful. I try. <laughs> I understand that your parents escaped Vietnam by boat. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about their business and what it was like for you growing up in Boston? Yeah. Um, so growing up, both of my parents were business owners. My mom, for as long as I can remember, worked in a laundromat and dry cleaner, um, and it was her own laundromat and dry cleaner. And then my dad, he had a house painting business at first, and then later on my dad transitioned into floor sanding and he started a floor sanding business. And, you know, when I was younger, like in elementary school, middle school, high school, I never thought it was cool that my parents had their own businesses. I never really saw a value in that. All I saw was, oh, my mom works in laundromat and my, dad, my, and my dad does floors. Like, I thought that I, I was, if anything, I was like, oh, my parents are like in really like low wage manual labor jobs, right? Um, and so I saw them working hard all the time, especially my mom, because she would be the one to take me to school in the morning. So every morning we'd wake up extra early and we'd go to her um, laundromat and then I'd hang out there and then the school bus would pick me up from the laundromat and it would also drop me off at the laundromat. So then I would spend my entire afternoons um, at the laundromat doing homework and just um, hanging out with my mom, helping her out, folding clothes until it was time for her to close the shop and then we'd go home together, right? So I watched my parents work really hard and I, I always knew they were like extremely hard workers. Um, and I thought it was really cool, you know, that my mom had a shop, but it wasn't until I got older that I started to take pride in the fact that my parents were business owners. Did you view it differently because their jobs weren't white collar jobs? Like they weren't going into an office. Is that why you sort of had this feeling about it? Yeah, like... I viewed it differently because I felt like, you know, they were like manual workers, you know, and and like my mom would do laundry for other people's parents at my schools, you know, or um, she'd like wash the towels for the neighborhood clinic or something. Right. So I just kind of saw her like in a job that was in service of people in my community and in some ways, I, I guess when I was younger, I just viewed it as like, oh, we're not like we're not as good as other people. Um, but I was totally missing the fact that my mom was a business owner, which was, in essence, an amazing thing to to really be proud of. Yeah, super admirable, because yeah. not only was she working hard, but as business owners, they were pouring their blood, sweat and tears mm -hmm. for their own business. Like yeah. they got the fruits of that hard work. Yeah. So at the risk of using labels, I got these off of your website. Okay. It says that you're a writer, a director, mm -hmm. a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. It seems like you do a lot of things. How do you answer the question when someone asks you, what do you do? I start with those first few labels. <laughs> um, and, and, that, and the answer to that question, it's always evolving, you know, as I'm also evolving and as like my priorities evolve. But right now, if someone asks, what do you do? I would first and foremost start with, I'm an artist and I'm a creative. I'm a storyteller. And more specifically, I channel all that through film, through media and through business. Yeah, I was really struck by the diversity of things that you've done because I saw poetry, I saw spoken poetry, yeah. so I saw keynote speaker, I uh -huh. saw visual artist, right. the painting, right. and that you own your own production company. And there's actually more than that. But <laughs> I don't know. When I first looked at all those things, I kind right. of saw like painter first. Is this true? Like I saw a painter and then almost like a tree growing branches in all these different directions, but sort of the painting and that creativity sort of as the foundation of all those things. Yeah. Well, painting was really my first love. Like being a visual artist is something that 
I've done since before I could speak, right? Like that painting or art and visual art was really my first love. Like I, I remember growing up in preschool, elementary school, I just loved drawing and I loved coloring and I loved you know, painting with any medium I could get my hands on, whether that was watercolors or acrylic. So I, I do think that my visual art and my painting has set a strong foundation for my creative expression. Um, but I would say that the real overarching thing is, is storytelling, right? And I think whether I'm painting or whether I'm writing poetry or I'm performing or I'm speaking or I'm, you know, making a film or even building a business, I'm telling a story through all those channels. And that's why, you know, even though entrepreneurship and being a business owner is a really big part of my identity today, I still identify more strongly as an artist, right? Because as an artist, I'm creating something and I also see my business my businesses as as something that I'm creating. It's an extension of me as an artist. Um, it just also happens to have a very like numbers um, savvy piece to it. But for the most part, I just see it as an extension of me being an artist and being someone who is creating something into this world and telling a story. Storytelling is so powerful. Is that something that came natural to you or did you study that in school? I'd say that storytelling became more natural to me when I started to find my voice in high school through community organizing and youth activism and also through writing poetry. When I was in high school, I was a part of a youth organizing group that worked on different community issues and and we did, you know, workshops for youth. And I, I also started developing my writing at the time because one of the coordinators of the program was also a poet who also integrated like spoken word poetry and creative writing into the learning process for us. So through, I'd say, through ethnic studies and Asian American studies in poetry, through the exploration of all those areas, that's when I started to really find my voice and my self-confidence. And once I tapped into that, then I was just, I just became obsessed with storytelling, right? And at first it was me being obsessed about telling my story because I had felt, you know, invisible, or underrepresented or unrepresented for so long growing up as like, a child of immigrants in America, right? So it was all about telling my story. And then as I evolved, I just wanted to tell more stories, right? Like beyond my own stories. And yeah, and I think once I tapped into that, it, it has felt very natural to me um, since I started. You've used your skill for storytelling in many different ways. As an entrepreneur, you own a restaurant or you're a co-owner of a restaurant and you're using that storytelling and creativity to do some of the PR and create, like, what is the story of the restaurant and what does it represent? Right. And then also filmmaking, which with filmmaking, it seems, you know, a little bit more obvious. It's like Mm -hmm. clearly in film, you have to have a story. What are some of the important pieces of the story that you hope will resonate with people? Like, are there building blocks that you use when thinking about what kind of story do you want for a restaurant or what kind of story are you trying to tell in a documentary that you've done? Mm. I think that when I'm approaching making a film or a documentary film or more recently building my, my new business, this coffee company, I'd say that the one common thing that I think about across all of those things is what truth or what truths can I highlight and share that maybe people don't know yet, right? Or maybe they do know and I just want to like amplify it even more, right? So for example, with my last documentary, Deported, it was about amplifying a truth within the immigration history and story of America and within the South, Southeast Asian American community um, that people weren't really aware of and that was about deportation. Um, with New Yen Coffee Supply, it was about amplifying a truth um, that Vietnam is the second largest producer of coffee in the world um, and that the U.S. is the number one importer of coffee beans from Vietnam, right? So in a sense, it's kind of like working with what already exists, what already is happening, but perhaps people don't know about or they're not aware or they don't care to learn or they're not engaged with. And I see my role as a storyteller, as an artist, as a creator, as an entrepreneur, is to help amplify 
these truths so that we can all develop a deeper understanding of each other and the cultures and communities that um, surround us. So I'd say that is the thing that um, the main foundation in everything that I build, it's kind of looking at what is the truth here and how can I um, amplify that for people. In the planning process, what does that look like? Does that look like an outline or is it a board with like sticky notes on it and you're just trying to like throw ideas on the wall and then identify, all right, here's a truth, here's a truth? Yeah, it, it's a lot of research in the beginning. So I, I do a lot of research through the internet, through looking at other people's research, downloading PDFs and documents and decks, and then talking to people, connecting with people who I feel may have knowledge or expertise in the area and talking to them, talking to people who are involved in the industry or involved in the movement or the issue that I'm exploring, um, talking to people who are impacted, right? We're talking to consumers and producers, right? So yes, it starts with research. And then for me, I like to write everything down. And then I just, um, because I spend a lot of time on my computer, so I'll use tools like Documents or Google Drive, and that way I can always add to it. And then over time, I'll just kind of extract some of the main ideas I want to kind of hone in on. I have a whiteboard that I use sometimes, um, but I'm not, at like a, I'm not like a sticky sheets person. It's mostly just typing and writing everything down in a notebook. Okay, so either the notebook or it's digital, yes. and you're like writing yes. it into yes, your phone two. or a computer or something. My phone, I'll write lots of things in my um, text app as well on my phone, yeah. Is that because ideas and inspiration sort of come sporadically, so you have to like write it down so that you don't forget? Absolutely, things come sporadically, but also there's just so many things running through my mind at any given point of the day, so I, I have to write it down, otherwise I'll just forget it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we mentioned the co-ownership of the Vietnamese restaurant Lucy's Vietnamese Kitchen in Bushwick in Brooklyn. And I, I read that in the first nine months, it was recognized as best Vietnamese <laughs> restaurant. I don't know where. In one of the, in one of the awards, there are many platforms. Yeah, but that was with Epic Times. <laughs> That's really cool. So what was the story there that you were trying to tell? The story there was really about, you know, a Vietnamese American experience right and our menu wasn't really traditional and it wasn't really american it was kind of bringing the two together it was bringing like smoked brisket which is very american and like vietnamese food like pho or the vietnamese broth which is very vietnamese and just kind of showcasing you know what we can have when we bring two cultures together and it's really a reflection of the first generation vietnamese american experience so that's like coming from you as the storyteller. To what extent do you have to think about the audience who is listening? Mm. To what extent do you have to clearly identify, are you speaking to a Caucasian in Brooklyn mm -hmm. or an Asian in Brooklyn mm -hmm. or a fellow Vietnamese immigrant in Brooklyn? Mm. To be honest, I don't think about the audience too much when I'm crafting my stories and when I'm thinking about the truths I want to share, I'll think about the audience in terms of like how I can shape my language or shape my approach. If it's going to be for social media, if it's going to be for an article, if it's going to be for a film, like I can consider how audiences consume material through those different media. But I don't think too much about what the audience wants or how they would react to something. I focus more on the subject and the truth and the topic that I want to share. And I'm going to share that to the best of my abilities in a way that is honest and responsible and integrity filled. And whoever resonates with my message or whoever resonates with my, you know, my stories, or my content, I'm happy to connect with them, you know, and if it if there are people that don't resonate with my stories, then that's fine as well. Right. Um, I think it's knowing that you can't ever please everybody, but even more so you can't write or share or create for other people. Right. You have to write and create and share first and foremost for yourself and then considering the social responsibility that you have and, um, you know, in relation to the stories that you're telling, if it involves other people, and then just doing it in a very responsible and honest way. I think those are the main areas I focus on. And then the audience, you know, I just like to see what comes when it comes. So that's part of your process. It's that you're creating something. You are trying to create your own story. Mm-hmm. 
you're putting it out to the world and then kind of seeing what happens. Yeah. Because you don't know for sure. That's a risk. You don't know and there's no way of controlling it, right? You can't control that. So for me, I rather focus on the areas that I can control and that is how to create, craft, and share a story. It's really interesting because um, you're talking about writing the story more for yourself and getting back to your documentary series, Departed, I understand that you created that without funding. You did it on your own. No? no. Not that one. Wasn't there another one that Maker's you created? Maker's Lane. Oh, Maker's Lane. Yeah. Okay, so with Maker's Lane, you had this passion mm -hmm. for the story. You were going to do it whether you made money or not. Yes, absolutely. So Maker's Lane was the first documentary series that I had created when I first moved to New York. And you're absolutely right. It was a total one-person production. I was producing it and, and reaching out to people and interviewing people. And I was filming everything and editing the series. What was that about? Maker's Lane is a documentary series about creative entrepreneurs in New York City. The first season focuses specifically on Asian American entrepreneurs, and the second season features a more diverse range of entrepreneurs in New York City. And so at that time, I just, I was so excited to tell this story. And I, I felt like Asian Americans and people of color in general, especially in the creative entrepreneurship field, weren't being uplifted and weren't being talked about enough when we think about innovation or creativity or leadership we don't often see images of people of color and so that's something that I really wanted to to highlight because being a person of color and an Asian American and a creative person and entrepreneur in New York City it's all I see around me right and I'm like well how come this isn't being reflected more in the media so I just you know bought a camera and I, I started filming people and interviewing them and then it's released on YouTube and you know it really got the attention of lots of great people like at the Smithsonian and NBC and that's what actually led to my following projects with NBC News, Self Starters and Deported. So it's really a success story of creating for the sake of creating mm -hmm. and then you put it out on YouTube and you actually got your work in front of the right people mm -hmm. that could make like a commercial transaction happen. Exactly. You're a creator. You're an artist, right, at the core. Mm -hmm. But you're also able to bridge that creativity and artistic side with a business and commercial side. And not everybody is able to do that. How do you do that? <laughs> um, I don't know. I... Because you're right, I think everybody's different. There's some people, like, on the spectrum of, like, creativity and being an artist or being an entrepreneur, people fall, you know, all along the spectrum. And I, I do feel like I've, I've kind of possessed this combination of DNA and personality and wits that allows me to be somewhere flowing on the spectrum between artist and entrepreneur. I don't know where it came from. Um, you know, there are folks in my artist community who might be like, you're not focusing on your art enough. And there are folks in my business community who are like, you're not focusing on your business enough, right? So I don't know. Everyone's different. I, For me, I guess it might be part of my upbringing. I think like at my core, I am an artist. I remember at such a young age, like in kindergarten and early elementary school, I always told my mom, mom, I want to be an artist when I grow up. I want to be a painter, right? And she was like, no, you can't do that, right? So, but that was always in me. And then I think maybe my parents, they, they probably shaped the the business side of me without me even knowing it, right? Just like kind of growing up and watching them be business owners and like having them teach me about how to be frugal and mindful about money and also just kind of teaching me lessons of like, well, if you don't want to struggle, you have to like have a good education, you have to have a good job. I think all of those lessons were really ingrained in me and, I, and maybe that has helped me develop my, my knack for entrepreneurship. Um, so I would say that the business side of me was more of a development over time from my my cultural and family upbringing and the artist part of me I feel like has just always been a natural piece of me which comes first one can look at it as okay let's look at the creative side first and create the story create right whatever the creative part is work on that first there's also the entrepreneur who might just be looking at numbers first mm -hmm. like how big is this market how much of this market can we sell into and then it's sort of in between. I mean, entrepreneur and creative, kind of the same thing, but which comes first, chicken or the egg, or mm -hmm. both at the same time? 
Yeah, I think I think that definitely varies with each person. And for me, it, it has fluctuated over time. You know, at different points in my life, there was you know a time when. I was definitely leaning more on the creative side, right? And I wasn't very smart about numbers and I wasn't as number savvy. Coming up, we talk about self-promotion, social media, building systems, and more. But first, Sarah is evolving as an artist and business person. Um, and now I feel like as I'm getting older, I'm, I'm like flowing more towards the number side and just trying to get more sharp and um, intentional about everything numbers related. So... You know, I'm, I definitely care about all of that information. I care about data. I care about, you know, the industry. I care about market share. I care about the TAMs, you know, total addressable market. I care about all that stuff now. Um, I will, if I had to choose, for me, I'd say the creative just comes just a half step first. Um, it's where, it's, it's really the thing that sparks my passion. And then I come right after that with all of the numbers and all the data and all of like the actual information to support my, my vision for building a successful business. The show notes for this episode can be found at inspiredmoney.fm forward slash 088. If you're listening in your car or wherever you are, check the show notes if you want to learn more about Sarah or things mentioned in this episode. It's time for the Runny Mead Money Tip of the Week. So this week, not so much a direct money tip, but I saw something really cool on Facebook. My friend Kuulani Keoho Kalole posted this, and I wanted to share it with you. It's Yukon High School's annual reality check. This school in Yukon, Oklahoma, hosts a two-hour period where over 650 freshmen at Yukon High School get a taste of what life is like to manage finances as an adult. During the event, freshman students are assigned a career, and that comes with an annual salary, marital status, and up to three children. They're sent with a checkbook in hand into a mock community. And this is the other cool part of this exercise. The community includes approximately 20 separate booths full of local businessmen and women who are eager to teach lessons on just how far a dollar can go. Community participants include bankers, realtors, physicians, dentists, hairstylists, daycare owners, car dealers, police, and many other volunteers. The students can make virtual payments from their budget toward housing, clothing, insurance, childcare, and other expenses. One ninth grader reflected, I got $35,000, which I thought was really good, but now I'm down to $20 and still have bills. I may have gone a little crazy with the nice truck. Once they've paid their bills, the students who have money left over receive a Kit Kat as a reward, while those with zero dollars left in their bank account receive a zero bar. I love this exercise. It's super practical, and I'm sharing it with you because if you're a teacher, maybe you can implement this in your school, or if you have kids, maybe you can recreate your own reality check at home. A shout out and thank you to Yukon Public Schools for organizing such a fantastic event that not only teaches students about money, but brings the community together. I hope that your example spreads to other communities and states across our nation, and maybe beyond. What you're doing is very powerful. That's the Runny Mead Money Tip of the Week. Inspired Money is brought to you by Runnymede Capital Management. We help you to plan, invest, and worry less. So what's your biggest financial challenge right now? Do you need help or have a money question? Go to inspiredmoney.fm forward slash Andy to email me or schedule a 15-minute call at inspiredmoney.fm forward slash 15. We can talk about anything. Your money, the show, your 401k, whatever. I'd love to hear from you. You're listening to Inspired Money. I'm Andy Wong. I think when it comes to the commercial side of art, it requires promoting yourself. And many of us have a hard time doing that. How do you do that? Hmm. <laughs> I feel like I still struggle with that, you know, promoting myself. If, if I was better at it, I feel like I'd be at like 100K followers on Instagram. And I'm not, you know, I've been at like 4K for like the last two years because you know, I, I try, I do try very hard um, when it comes to promoting myself on a personal level. However, I will say that it just doesn't come as naturally to me and I don't enjoy it as much as other people would. I, it's, it's really, um, 
something that I really have to force myself to do. And where I'm at right now, you know, whether I'm good at it or not good at it or somewhere in between, I will say that it has taken a lot of practice to even be where I am right now with how I use and engage my social media and how I promote myself, right? Or the extent of my self-promotion. It's, it's, it's been a very long journey and it's still a work in progress. It's, it, it has not been easy for me and I still don't find it easy. However, I would say that it just takes practice. It's, it's the practice of like physically thinking about the content you want to create. Do you set time aside to create this content? Do you set time aside to plan this content? And I'm not saying I do all those things, but these are questions I would have to think through. And then it's also like the mental and emotional practice as well of like, it's okay to share this photo of yourself doing this. It's okay to promote yourself like, oh, if I share this, people are going to think that I'm so full of myself. Oh, this is like so OD. Is this too much? You know, all the thoughts still come through my mind and they were much more intense when I was like younger, like, like all this self-consciousness of self-promotion. And I think it's, it, it, for me, it comes down to practice, like the, the mental practice of training yourself to be more accepting and okay with self-promotion and also the physical practice of finding and creating content and knowing what to share and when to share and how to talk about it. And it, it requires strategy and strategic thinking too, right? Because you have to identify like who are you trying to get in front of and who are you trying to reach with your message? Uh, in the case of being a filmmaker, it's like you need to be getting your work in front of the right people at NBC, for example. Mm -hmm. How are you spending your time these days? Are you spending as much time on filmmaking or is your attention spent on like these new ventures? And maybe you can talk about that balance or yeah. where you're focusing. Yeah. So we just got a premiere date on this film project that I've been working on for the last six months. And, you know, the thing with film and media is that so much of it pre-launch is behind the scenes and you know so there isn't always an opportunity to talk about it on social media especially if there are certain agreements in place saying like you can't talk about this until we've all discussed as a company like when we can announce it right so I would say that for the last six months, like my social media public narrative has been very NCS heavy. NCS is New York Coffee Supply, has been very business and very coffee heavy. However, at the same time, I've been co-producing behind the scenes this digital series for PBS, which I cannot talk about because we just got a premiere date this week. Um, you know, and so, and, and it just kind of, in general, it goes to remind people that everything you see on Instagram, it's not all of it. It's, it's really just a slice of it, whether it's a slice of the best or just a slice of what you're working on. Um, I'm working on so many things all the time that never makes it to Instagram or social media. Um, but I'd say for the last six months, for the last 18 months, really, my, time's, my, my time has been pretty split between media projects and film projects, whether that was applying or pitching or, um, you know, actually filming and producing different works. Um, 2018, I worked on a few really great film projects. And then alongside, I was building NCS. I launched NCS in November of 2018. So now, it, you know, with the PBS film series kind of like winding down as we're in post-production now, um, NCS has really been picking up, right? So these things, it, it comes in waves, right? There are times where I'm more heavy on the creative. There are times when I'm more heavy on media. There are times when I'm, when I'm more heavy on business. And there are times when it's split pretty 50-50. Um, right now, it is leaning more towards business because I, I just launched NCS. I'm about to launch my cafe in the Lower East Side, which is a, a secondary project to NCS. So in the beginning of any business it, it requires so much of you it's like I remembered when I was launching you know my restaurant in the beginning it's like a newborn baby it needs so much love and attention and care and then the hope is that you build it to a place where it's like smooth sailing you have a team in place you have a system in place where you can then kind of lean back a little bit um to move on to build the next thing yeah are you good with implementing those processes and systems so that it can run more independently? I like to think that I am. 
I'm, I mean, I'm very invested in everything I create, and to some extent, there is an attachment to what I create because I feel like it's a part of me, it's a piece of me, right? But at the same time, I value the power of community and teamwork so much because I know that whatever I'm working on, whether it's a film project or a business, my work and my vision has so much more potential to go further if I can bring people into the fold, right? So that being said, I'm very keen on trying to create systems um, that will allow me to, to step away because at the end of the day, I want longevity and I want sustainability and there's no way any one project can sustain itself for a very long time in my eyes if I'm the only one like working on it. So yes, I, I'm very keen on creating these systems. I'm, 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 I'm comfortable, um, more than comfortable implementing them um, in the pursuit of sustainability and longevity. So again, it sounds like it comes back to the creative side. You're coming up with the ideas, mm-hmm. you create it into a reality, and then hopefully it's running on its own and you can move on to create the next new thing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where your passion and energy is. I love creating things. I, again, that, that's the core who I am as an artist. I love creating things, whether it's a film or a business venture. I love starting with an idea in my head and I love bringing it to life like, and embracing all the challenges of you know, creating it. I just find that so exciting. And I'm constantly looking for, you know, new challenges. And with NCS, you know, I, I, I'm not saying that with NCS I'm going to stop working on it one day. But my goal is to continue growing it to be as big as possible. Um, and that could be for the rest of my life, right? Or if I reach a point where I feel like I'm no longer finding challenges in NCS or it's no longer helping me grow as a person, then, or in general, you know, whatever I'm working on, when once I reach a a point where I feel like it's not helping me grow anymore, that's when I get really thirsty for the next challenge. We sort of brushed upon a lot of projects because you're involved in so much from NCS to uh, Departed to Maker's Lane to Lucy's Vietnamese Kitchen. So I'll include links in the show notes for all those things. (laughs) I don't want to let the opportunity to pass with the PBS series. Yeah. Like, what's that all about? Oh, this conversation came at a really great time because if you asked me this last week, I wouldn't have been able to talk about it. The PBS series, it's a four-part digital series based on a book um, by Jeff Chang called We Gonna Be All Right, Notes on Race and Resegregation in America. It's really an adaptation of, uh, an adaptation of his book where we're exploring through different stories, um, whether it's about gentrification in Silicon Valley or diversity in Hollywood or the education crisis um, or the idea of you know, living in between cultures. Through all these different lenses, we're talking about race in America and looking at how all these things or everything that we're going through can actually lead us towards more resegregation. Hmm. So the premiere date for this is May 14th. <laughs> um, hopefully this will come out by then. It'll definitely be out before that. <laughs> yeah. So people can look out for that. Yes. So it, it sounds like the activism comes back with this uh, PBS series. Mm-hmm. Why is that so important to you? I mean, it, it sounds like it was really a pivotal part of your development because you mentioned that it was that time looking at your heritage and at Asian Americans and Vietnamese as a group that one, that you found your voice, Mm -hmm. which was huge, Mm -hmm. but then two, it has continued to run, like it's played an important role and been a thread through most of the things that you do. Why is it important for you to be really working on something that's bigger than yourself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for nailing um, that summary. I would say that it's activism has been a part of everything I've done, really. Um, And and you nailed it. It's because activism was such a critical point in my personal development, in the formation of my identity and my voice and how I 
view myself and how I move into the world. So I carry that with me through everything I do, whether it's direct community organizing or through film or building a business, right? I really carry and try to execute on a lot of the values of activism that I find important, such as increasing visibility, increasing representation, um, community empowerment, amplifying voices from historically marginalized communities, right? All those things can be seen in my film work and my businesses, even coffee, right? Um, so to your question of why do I think it's important to work on something bigger than myself, this is the right thing to do, you know? Like my community and so many communities have been oppressed and continue to be oppressed and continue to be disenfranchised and continue to be discriminated against every day in this country that there is so much work that we can be doing to close that gap, you know, whether it's that gap in in educational economic equity or that gap in um, social racial understanding or compassion, right? There's so much that we can do to bring us closer and we're connected as a society. And so I guess I just feel like, you know, if I'm going to be living in this world and participating in this world, I just want to make it a better world any way I can. And and when I'm working on a project, whether it's a business or a film, how can I approach this project that would also help support the world in what it needs right now? And I think what the world needs is more kindness, more love, more understanding. Um, and so, of course, say in business, I have a goal of like, well, I want the business to be profitable so that it can be sustainable. But how can I use this platform in this process to also forward the values of activism that I find important, um, including like how to treat people well, how to treat people on my team well, how to um, bring out a narrative about Vietnamese culture that may not have been um, really uplifted before. Right. There's so many ways to 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 accomplish all these goals for the betterment of society through the process and um, the platform of business or film if you have the intent to do so. Yeah, to help you out, I was going to throw out the word legacy, but then <laughs> I thought about something that I heard you say, and I think that this is even better. Be the change that you want to see. Mm -hmm. yeah. It sounds like that's what you're trying to do. Yeah. It's action. You don't want to sit on the sidelines and just hope for change. Exactly. Exactly. Um, it's in, I would also add to that, if you are somebody who doesn't necessarily care for change or think about wanting change, I would just say that I believe we all have a social responsibility to contribute to our communities and society um, that makes it a better experience for everyone to be a part of, right? Because there are people who are like, well, I don't need to be the change I want to because I actually I'm fine with things the way they are, right? Um, and I would just challenge that notion of there is a social responsibility that we can all own up to. Um, and I think that if we all recognize that and held ourselves accountable to that, we could experience such a an even better and even more wonderful world. I love that. Yes. There's always room for improvement, mm -hmm. no matter where we are. Mm -hmm. Sarah, I like to ask all the Inspired Money guests, how do you define success? Mm. For me, I define success as having creative and financial freedom so that I can enjoy my life and pursue all of my personal and professional goals without limitations. And the way I've come to define success in that way is because I have I guess I feel like I've experienced so many limitations growing up, whether that was limitations because of my race or my gender or money, right? Or wanting to make a film but not having the network or uh, the right person to call or money to do that, right? I felt so many limitations um, from different areas. And so for me, success is having that creative and financial freedom um, to just see what I can accomplish. And I will also add success to me is having positive mental health, right? I, 
that's something that my mom is really big on. Her slogan is like happy and healthy. And so as I'm pursuing these new ventures and pursuing these projects and pursuing legacy even, right, I like to remind myself that none of that matters to me or to my family if I don't have mental health. So if I can accomplish, you know, freedom and mental health and, and have a positive state of mental health, I really find that to be my definition of success. Yeah, it sounds like you've never taken that freedom for granted. And the mental health part is really important, especially in the world of entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. because there are so many ups and downs. Mm -hmm. And it's often... I think forgotten or not spoken about mm -hmm. that entrepreneurial life is not easy. Mm -hmm. And because of those highs and lows that it's not uncommon for people to be depressed or to be down. I'm glad that you brought that up. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing your storytelling with us, your experience as a filmmaker, as a creative and as an entrepreneur. Can you tell the Inspired Money listener how to follow you, learn more about your businesses, and learn more about you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much, Andy, again, for having me. For anyone listening, you can find me on Instagram at one ounce gold, spelled out. That's O N E O U N C E G O L D. And you can follow my latest venture called Nguyen Coffee Supply, N G U Y E N C O F F E E. S-U-P-P-L-Y, same Instagram handle. And also we are launching a cafe, Speakeasy, inside the Lower East Side's On Choi Restaurant Bar. We're launching April 10th. We'll be there five days a week. Find us online, and I hope to see you there. We hope that you find some time for self-care, because that <laughs> sounds like a lot. Thank you, thank you so much for letting us record at your listening party studios Absolutely. here at Canal Street Market. Anytime, anytime, Andy. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. So what was your favorite Inspired Money moment? For me, the big takeaway this week is storytelling. How can you use storytelling from social media posts to creating a brand or business. Storytelling and narrative is not just for the movies. In ancient times, history was passed from one generation to the next through story. So it's a powerful tool even in the 21st century. If you had a different favorite Inspired Money moment and takeaway, let me know by going to inspiredmoney.fm forward slash Facebook. Let's continue the conversation there. Thank you so much for listening. If you like this Inspired Money episode, please share it. Share it on social media or tell a friend. Thanks again for joining me on this mission. The music you're listening to right now and all other music on today's show is by the amazing Jim Kimo West. Have an inspired week and do something that scares you because that's where the magic happens.